Your Excellency, Ambassador Jelani, Consul General Mahmoud, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, truly my privilege to welcome you to the Baker Institute uh, this evening for a discussion on Pakistan's vision for peace and prosperity in South Asia. I would like to thank the Consul General and the uh, Pakistani Consulate in Houston for helping make this event possible in partnership with the Baker Institute Center for the Middle East. Although Pakistan is considered part of South Asia, we, we have a broad vision of the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> As we have seen since uh, the elections last year, and we are witnessing even today, uh, Pakistan faces serious domestic and foreign policy challenges. Democracy, as we Americans know, is a very messy process. Look how dysfunctional our capital is in Washington. The historic transfer of power from one civilian government in Pakistan to another in 2013 has unfortunately uh, <clears throat> resulted, did not result in increased political stability or cooperation. Indeed, the uh, current political crisis in Pakistan highlights the fragility of evolving democracies and the constant threats they face. But Pakistan has a tradition of the rule of law, a judiciary, an independent judiciary, and uh, uh, and uh, it has uh, positive assets institutionally that can prevail. On the regional level, Pakistan, as we all know, is a nuclear power, but one that must address complex challenges uh, along its borders, from normalizing relations with India, a key relationship, to containing violence and extremist threats across the border in Afghanistan. So building and maintaining a working U.S.-Pakistan relationship is no easy task. It is not without its irritants, its obstacles, but there's no doubt that a common set of vital interests unite our two countries. The strategic dialogue between the U.S. and Pakistan, initiated in 2010, has shown new life. Today we are seeing new conversations addressing key concerns, including economic, financial issues, counterterrorism, defense cooperation, energy development, and education. In sum, U.S.-Pakistani ties are crucial to any efforts to foster regional peace and development in that very important part of the world. I am very pleased to welcome as tonight's speaker a very distinguished diplomat serving at the heart of the U.S.-Pakistani relationship. His Excellency Jalil Abbas Jilani, before assuming his role as Ambassador of Pakistan to the United States in January of this year, he served as Pakistan's Foreign Secretary. I guess you can't send instructions to yourself as a... <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> he has also had diplomatic postings in Saudi Arabia, the United Kingdom, Australia, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the European Union. So we are privileged to have him here this evening, and we look forward to his insights. The ambassador has graciously accepted uh, to answer questions uh, after his uh, remarks. <clears throat> Just raise your hand and uh, uh, ask a question. Uh, please join me now in giving a very warm welcome to His Excellency Jalil Abbas Jalali. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful audience, and thank you, Ambassador Edward Georgian, uh, for, a, for your introduction. Uh, we know you for a long time for your services to, uh, uh, to uh, building a strong relationship, not only between the South Asian countries and the United States of America, but also the Middle Eastern countries. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking the James Baker Institute for inviting me this, this afternoon to share my perspectives on Pakistan's vision on peace and stability in South Asia. This is a, an important issue, and I think a, a discussion on this important issue was timely and uh, uh, in order. And I look forward to an interactive uh, uh, session this afternoon, and I'll be very happy if uh, uh, any question that your, comes to your mind, no whole bars question, uh, could be posed to me. Uh, you mentioned uh, Middle East and South Asia, yes, our DNA is different from the other Middle Eastern countries, but uh, we have very strong connection with the Middle Eastern countries. Um, South Asia um, is certainly one of the largest regions uh, in, of the world with a population of 
1.67 billion people. That was the census of 2013. And uh, we have absolutely no doubt that without peace in, uh, within the region and uh, uh, around our region, there can be no lasting peace in the world. Uh, we enjoy a, a pivotal uh, geostrategic location. Uh, we are at the crossroads of three very important regions, uh, South Asia, Central Asia, and West Asia. Uh, we therefore act as a bridge between all these three important regions. Uh, for those of, those of you who uh, are not aware of the interesting geography that we have, uh, we share uh, 2,900 kilometers long border with India. Uh, we share 2,650 kilometers long border with Afghanistan. Uh, we share 1,000 kilometers long border with Iran, and we share 900 kilometers long border with China. I'm sure that you all must be feeling quite envious of my country. For, 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 uh, we have been, <coughs> the region has had its share of uh, problems, challenges, including terrorism. Uh, border conflicts. Uh, we have had border issues with uh, uh, the um, with India. Uh, we energy crisis, population explosion, uh, water scarcity, uh, climate change, uh, volatile economic growth, uh, poverty, and irregular urbanization. Uh, uh, as far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, we too have been in the eye of the storm for a long time, uh, but um, certainly the situation is looking up. Uh, I say this because of a number of very important developments that have taken place. I would say that uh, Pakistan has changed in many respects. Uh, one, uh, democracy has taken uh, strong roots, as the ambassador, uh, as uh, Ed uh, uh, Georgian had just rightly mentioned. One democratically elected government, after completing its five years tenure, was replaced by another uh, democratically elected government. Uh, the uh, uh, active, there is an active uh, judiciary in the country, uh, active and strong judiciary in the country. We have one of the uh, fiercely independent and ruthless media uh, in Pakistan. Uh, you would, uh, uh, we have about 100 television channels and each one of the uh, television channels are trying to compete with, with each other in order to, um, to um, uh, pick holes in the government and the judiciary and the uh, parliament and, uh, the, uh, uh, and highlighting issues like corruption uh, and other. So there is a, a kind of a, uh, a correcting mechanism that is also underway. Uh, and also uh, there is uh, a, an increased urbanization which is taking place. There is a literacy rate is also uh, growing and people are becoming much more aware, aware of their rights and responsibilities in the country. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, as far as the priorities of the new government are concerned, uh, the priorities obviously uh, include an end to, pro to, um, to poverty, uh, economic development, uh, extremism and terrorism. Uh, that had emerged as a major challenge uh, to our country uh, and and we would be like to believe that uh, uh, Pakistan, a moderate country, uh, we began to witness this phenomena following the uh, unfortunate developments in Afghanistan because uh, uh, the, I think it was also the results of our own acts of commission and omission uh, of the late 70, 70s when all these jihadi elements from all over the world they were encouraged to come to Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union. And that's the legacy that continues to haunt us in, in Pakistan. And then um, uh, the next challenge is overcoming energy crisis to uh, uh, also focus on education. 
uh, and uh, improving the human rights situation uh, in the country. So these were the domestic priorities of the government. As far as uh, the, uh, uh, the external vision of the government of Pakistan is concerned, obviously improvement of relationship with the neighboring countries, particularly India, Afghanistan, is of uh, paramount importance because there is an across-the-board consensus in the country that we can't achieve economic development unless we create a conducive regional environment because of the of the uh, because of the opportunities, the enormous opportunities which are available to the countries of the region, uh, and I think uh, we have achieved uh, um, some impressive uh, progress in all these areas, as far as the domestic vision is concerned or the regional vision is concerned. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, economy has uh, picked up. Uh, GDP growth has registered an impressive growth from 3.1% last year to 4.1% this year. And IMF and World Bank in their latest report have projected uh, GDP growth to, be, uh, to, to grow by almost 5% by, by next year. Uh, debt to G GDP ratio has been improved. Uh, uh, Moody's has upgraded Pakistan's rating from negative to stable because of the reforms which were introduced by 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 and and by the government and also because of the developments which were taking place uh, in the on the uh, 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 as far as the uh, uh, extremism and terrorism is concerned. We uh, have evolved a comprehensive policy in order, to, in order to defeat the forces of extremism and terrorism. Uh, we have launched military operations in North Waziristan. Waziristan is a very large area bordering Afghanistan. It's, uh, uh, we had cleared South Waziristan in the last four to five years, and we have been able to consolidate our gains in South Waziristan. And there in South Waziristan, with the help of the United States of America, we have undertaken a number of projects, including uh, hydro projects, uh, the construction of road network. And today, the uh, North, South Waziristan gives a totally, completely different picture as compared to the past. Uh, North Waziristan operations, uh, which have been launched, which enjoy the support of the uh, entire Pakistani population. A total national consensus was achieved. Uh, we have launched these operations and we have cleared almost 80 to 85 percent of North Waziristan. We have been able to take out almost 700 to 800 uh, of these bad guys belonging to uh, Haqqani network, belonging to Al-Qaeda, belonging to Uzbeks, Chechens, and, and in the four to six weeks, we are absolutely confident that we will be able to clear rest of the uh, North Waziristan. And then about one million or so uh, IDPs, the internally displaced uh, persons, or the civilian population who were taken out of, uh, brought to the safer locations uh, in camps, we will take them back to their respective homes. Uh, so that's the kind of a strategy that we are following. And we are absolutely determined that we will uh, eliminate this menace uh, from Pakistan. Uh, we have simultaneously launched operations in the urban centers uh, with improved intelligence, with the uh, increased capacity uh, of the improved capacity of the civil armed forces. We have again busted a large number of uh, these uh, jihadi organization groups in the urban centers of Pakistan. And that's one reason that you must have noticed that the incidents of terrorism in the last four to five months, they have reduced drastically in Pakistan. Uh, on uh, the energy side, we have launched a number of mega projects in order to, and again, I must acknowledge the uh, very strong support that we are receiving from the United States of America on the energy sector uh, projects uh, that we are developing. Uh, with the efforts which have been made by the U.S. Um, 
uh, we have been able to add about 1,200 megawatts of electricity to our national grid. Uh, energy shortages became a very, very serious problem. Uh, so, uh, and I think, uh, and the kind of support that we are now getting on the, uh, on some of the mega projects from the U.S. is again formidable. We have recently launched a 4,500 megawatts project, uh, mega dam project uh, with the U.S. help, uh, which is called Dasu Hydroelectric Project. Another project, uh, uh, Bhasha Dam, uh, U.S. and Pakistan, we are jointly going to organize an investors conference in October, on 8th of October, in order to launch the second project. Besides these two mega projects, we have launched many other projects which would add. And I think in the next, the way things are proceeding on the energy sector, we will become the energy exporting country in the, in the next seven to eight years. Uh, on education, the GDP allocation is being doubled. Uh, on human rights, we are making efforts to empower women and to protect the rights of the minorities. Uh, women, um, those of you are now uh, an active members of the society. Uh, we have 30% representation of women in our national parliament. We have 30% of uh, women's participation in all the provincial, the state assemblies. And we also have 30%. Uh, and this is something that was, that is a matter of, uh, that is in accordance with the legislation that was introduced in Pakistan. So that is, uh, again, something which is uh, a, a very impressive phenomena that we have witnessed in, uh, in recent uh, years. Uh, and, but the point is that despite these positive developments internally, uh, um, our vision to make uh, Pakistan a moderate, progressive, economically strong country cannot be achieved unless, uh, unless we uh, uh, improve the overall regional environment, uh, which is of uh, 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 significant importance. Accordingly, what we are trying to do is that we are, uh, we are reaching out to uh, India, we have reached out to Afghanistan, and we are making efforts to bring about peace and stability. In, in, the, in, the, in the area. Um, Afghanistan, uh, I think Afghanistan, in the case of Afghanistan, jointly, uh, uh, United States and Pakistan, we have uh, very closely uh, worked with each other in order to promote peace and stability in Afghanistan. Uh, we were, um, we also worked very, very closely in my previous capacity as Foreign Secretary and the U.S. Special Representative of Afghanistan and Pakistan. We used to work very closely with our Afghan colleagues in order to promote a reconciliation process between the government and the Afghan Taliban. So that's something that, and we, I think we did um, succeed in our efforts uh, in the shape of the Qatar process and also uh, many of the other interactions which began to take place between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Uh, we feel that Afghanistan is certainly at a defining uh, uh, moment in the history. And uh, we have witnessed that majority of the people in Afghanistan, they also uh, want to get out of this, uh, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this, this de decades of instability and conflict that they have been facing for the last many, 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 many years. Uh, one thing that um, we need to understand that uh, uh, that uh, in the case of Afghanistan, uh, uh, we enjoy a unique and symbiotic relationship with Afghanistan. Uh, besides shared history, culture, geography, uh, there are uh, our, the uh, makeup of the population on both the sides is also. Uh, similar, we have a very uh, large Pashtun population on this side of the border. As a matter of fact, maybe more than what Afghanistan has on its uh, uh, in within Afghanistan. And accordingly, we can neither um, insulate ourselves or uh, isolate ourselves uh, from each other. So that's, I think, perhaps one reason that every time there is a conflict in Afghanistan, we end up. Uh, getting scores of refugees crossing over to Pakistan. 
and people also in Pakistan, they would receive them with open arms. But at the same time, um, uh, we have uh, 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 I think probably no other, other country has suffered as much uh, because of the ongoing turmoil in Afghanistan as Pakistan has because besides uh, uh, the economic downturn that we have witnessed in the last uh, several uh, years because of the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, we uh, also witnessed gun culture, drug culture, and also a culture of an extremism and terrorism which were completely alien to Pakistan uh, before uh, you know, almost uh, two or three decades ago. So this is another, uh, so accordingly peace and stability uh, in Afghanistan is of paramount importance. And uh, uh, we are accordingly engaged in, uh, in various uh, efforts to ensure that Afghanistan uh, becomes developed economically, it, the security situation improves, and also uh, the uh, transitions which are taking place in Afghanistan, they also succeed uh, 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 in Afghanistan. Uh, important thing is that Afghanistan's uh, multiple transitions, which uh, uh, are very crucial, they should take place in a in a uh, in a in an orderly fashion. Uh, the uh, security transition, the political transition, the economic transitions in Afghanistan, uh, the uh, successful implementation of these transitions in Afghanistan would certainly uh, impact not only Afghanistan but the entire region. Uh, the challenge, obviously, uh, uh, for all of us is, to, is how to ensure uh, that uh, the regional uh, uh, security and stability and how to ensure that these uh, transitions, they uh, proceed um, uh, uh, in an orderly fashion in Afghanistan. I think from our point of view, this would require both pre preventive and uh, proactive efforts. Uh, preventive measures would obviously include enhanced border security uh, between Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the porous nature of the border uh, makes uh, this uh, border very, very insecure. Um, I call it insecure because, um, uh, because almost 60 to 70,000 people on a daily basis, they, they cross this border without any visa or without any papers, because of the easement rights that they have enjoyed for centuries. So many of these people, they come in the morning, they work in Peshawar and other cities in Pakistan, they earn their livelihood and then they go back to Afghanistan. But the point is that you don't know whether uh, these people, 60 or 70,000 people who cross on a daily basis, how many of them are genuine economic uh, uh, or job seekers or, or they uh, are um, uh, people who uh, belong to various terrorist organizations. So accordingly, this enhanced border security would be of paramount importance. We need to, Afghanistan also needs to recognize border. We need to have a uh, introduced biometric system on the border. And we need to ensure that uh, the, the uh, movement of people on the border is regulated. Uh, promotion, you know, uh, building defense and intelligence capabilities in Afghanistan is of uh, paramount importance. Uh, uh, Counterterrorism and counter narcotics efforts are again very, very important. Uh, we have seen a very strong link between narcotics and terrorism in our part of the world. And uh, as we see a growth of uh, uh, narcotics production in Afghanistan, that certainly uh, is something which needs to be addressed. Uh, the most important thing from our point of view, uh, as far as the preventive steps are concerned, is an inclusive reconciliation process. An inclusive reconciliation process means not only, a re not only reconciliation between uh, between uh, uh, the uh, Afghan mainstream political parties and Taliban, but also all the factions, because Afghanistan is a country which is, uh, which has, uh, you have Pashtuns, you have Uzbeks, you have Hazaras, you have various other 
uh, ethnic uh, groups, and they need to reconcile uh, between themselves. Uh, from our uh, perspective, uh, pre only these uh, preventive measures alone would not improve the situation. And unless we have some uh, proactive uh, measures are taken, which include uh, of the number one, the successful transitions. And the successful transition, obviously, number one is the political transition, uh, which is currently underway. Uh, it, there are major hip hiccups which have developed uh, on the vote recount, which is certainly a worrying phenomenon for all of, all of us. More so for Pakistan, because we were waiting with bated breath about the positive outcome of these elections, but uh, uh, this is something which, uh, uh, which gives us certainly sleepless nights. And obviously the next step would be the, um, the formation of the government uh, with uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, efforts of Secretary Kerry and President Obama, the Afghan government, uh, Afghan parties, they have agreed to a power sharing arrangements and we only hope that they stick to the arrangement that they have agreed upon. But then, as they say that the devil is in the details, uh, one does not really know as to what exactly would be the outcome. But the important thing for all of us is to continue to encourage uh, that process because that is of uh, uh, importance. Afghan National Security Forces, I think so far they have done very well. Um, they, they have been trained well and they have been able to withstand the pressure particularly during the elections from various uh, groups who were trying to disrupt the election process. Uh, economic uh, transformation, economic transition is very important in the case of Afghanistan and economic trans uh, tra uh, transition means that from a, a war economy Afghanistan should become a, a, a stable uh, economy in the coming days. And also then uh, the next is progress in peace and reconciliation uh, is also very important. The message to all Afghan stakeholders from everyone should be, it should be clear and unequivocal that they should negotiate, not fight, and uh, they should mutually understand each other and give and take because that's the only way that they will be able to bring peace and stability in Afghanistan. Another very important area that uh, we need to ensure is that there has to be a regional consensus on non-interference in Afghanistan because that's an issue, that's an area which uh, is of concern to many countries because the uh, unstable political situation, unstable environment in Afghanistan uh, was uh, was uh, being exploited by a number of, uh, by other countries to destabilize uh, 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 Pakistan. So that is something that uh, we, we need to ensure that that does not take place. Um, uh, a long-term economic assistance program for Afghanistan is also equally important. Uh, the economic vacuum because my my own visit to Afghanistan in the last visit to Afghanistan in December, early December of uh, last year, one could see that a lot of uh, uh, economic activity had slowed down. Most of the buildings which were under construction, there was no building activity. So accordingly, that's something that uh, need to be looked into because any vacuum, economic vacuum would have uh, post-2014 or to post-2015 will have uh, fearful consequences for everybody. Um, on our part, um, we have taken a number of steps in order to help Afghanistan economically. We have spent um, about $500 million in road construction, in the, develop in the building of construction of hospitals, in the construction of schools, in the construction of uh, uh, eye center and uh, also hostels for uh, boys and girls. Uh, and also we have built a uh, uh, road network. We have a trade volume of about $3 billion with Afghanistan, which is uh, quite substantial. And we have recently concluded uh, APTA, Afghanistan-Pakistan Tariff Trade Agreement, which is uh, being implemented. Um, I think uh, in the coming days, creating employment opportunities, human resource development, 
and uh, uh, regional economic integration, integration in the case of Afghanistan would be of tremendous importance. Uh, talking about Afghanistan, there are positive developments. I think that we need to, uh, to uh, which can be built upon. For instance, the um, Afghan elections have been relatively peaceful. Uh, the front runners, both president, uh, to, uh, presidential candidate Abdullah Abdullah and uh, Mr. Ashraf Ghani, they are both uh, educated people. Uh, they have chosen their running mates uh, very wisely in order to bridge the ethnic gaps, gap, which is also very important. Uh, Afghan army, as I mentioned, that has been able to withstand the, the pressure. And most important thing in the context of Afghanistan is that Afghanistan, despite 30 years of war, has not witnessed any uh, separatist or divisive tendency, which is remarkable in the case of, the case of Afghanistan. You have never heard any, uh, any movement that would, show, that would say that South should become independent or North should go uh, the other way. And then um, uh, another important thing is that uh, uh, both the candidates are also committed to signing BSA, which is important. Um, so these are some positive developments, uh, and also we have we are also witnessing that as compared to the past uh, many years, there is reduced interference in Afghanistan's uh, affairs as we witnessed during the recent election, Afghan elections. Um, uh, and again, unlike in the past, when the uh, uh, election results were predetermined, this time the election results were not predetermined. Uh, till the last minute, uh, people in Afghanistan, outside Afghanistan, we did not know as to who is going to emerge as a winner. And again, that is something which is, which is a positive uh, indication. India, um, uh, we have had a history of, uh, uh, I would say that uh, Pakistan-India history has not been a glorious one. Uh, we have had wars, we have had uh, tensions, uh, but I think uh, as part of our vision, uh, we are making efforts in order to improve relations with India. The Prime Minister, uh, uh, one thing that I am um, um, absolutely convinced and would like to bring it to your notice is that during the recent election, the last election in Pakistan, almost every political party in Pakistan, their election manifesto mentioned improved relation uh, with India. And that's the slogan on which the current prime minister won the election. Economic development and peaceful neighborhood, in including improved relations with India. That's the slogan on which he won the elections. So there is a national consensus, in other words, uh, in favor of improved relationship with India. Uh, Prime Minister attended the um, uh, inauguration ceremony of Indian Prime Minister, which from our point of view was again a bold decision taken by the Prime Minister. Uh, and the two leaders, they agreed to revive the composite, uh, to, to revive the dialogue process between the two countries. The dialogue process between Pakistan and India is suspended since December 2012. Mine was the last visit when I was the foreign secretary in the, uh, in, uh, in, uh, that I under, uh, went to India to, uh, to, uh, to have a discussion on, on three, uh, uh, to review the entire um, peace process and also to have discussions on, uh, on Kashmir, on terrorism, and also on nuclear non-proliferation and strategic stability. These are the three issues which are discussed at the level of the foreign secretaries of the two countries. There was, a, there was an agreement between the two prime ministers that the foreign secretaries of the two countries should meet soon to revive the, the dialogue process. The Indian Foreign Secretary, who was supposed to visit Pakistan on 25th of uh, uh, this month, uh, three days uh, ago, uh, suddenly the, uh, uh, the Indian side decided to call off the talks, uh, which uh, we feel uh, was an, a very unfortunate development. Uh, because uh, the meeting between the two prime ministers, their willingness to start the, the dialogue process, 
the uh, convergences of their economic agenda that had generated hopes in both the countries of a, a forward movement in the relationship between the two countries. But certainly the decision uh, to call off the talks has dented this perception, uh, not only in Pakistan, in the region, but around the world that the new Indian um, uh, prime minister uh, will, uh, will, uh, will demonstrate uh, 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 the, uh, the statesmanship in order to move forward in its relationship with Pakistan. And I, uh, we have absolutely no doubt that uh, uh, the economic agendas of both the countries, uh, uh, that is very much dependent on, on peace within the region. Uh, we, we obviously um, can, cannot achieve uh, progress. And it is certainly imperative that we come back to the negotiating uh, table as soon as possible. Uh, we are determined. We will continue to pursue uh, this, these objectives, uh, and uh, we will uh, 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 certainly make efforts. And any uh, uh, movement in the, in that direction would be of uh, uh, paramount importance. Besides uh, India and Pakistan, I thought that I would briefly touch upon the regional integration because that is also something which is of uh, paramount importance. Uh, regional integration uh, will certainly bring about peace and stability. Uh, Pakistan is pursuing a number of regional uh, economic integ integration projects and connectivity projects with the regional countries, and these include Pakistan-China Economic Corridor. Uh, we are building an economic corridor connecting uh, uh, the, the Chinese region of uh, Kashgar with uh, Gawadar port, the newly established Gawadar port in Balochistan. This would involve the construction of a road and rail link between, between Gawadar and China. And uh, along the route, obviously, there is the plans are to build uh, uh, the economic opportunity zones, the industrial zones. Then we are also pursu pursuing a number of transnational road, uh, railway, and gas pipeline projects. Uh, we are, for instance, we are pursuing an Islamabad to Istanbul uh, railway uh, service. The railway service has already started from Islamabad to Istanbul, but we are trying to upgrade that service. And then Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline project, gas pipeline project is another regional connectivity pro, uh, project that we are pursuing. And another project is uh, the CASA 1000, the, that would connect uh, electricity, that would develop an electricity uh, grid between, uh, uh, between Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. So these are, we, f uh, we feel, are uh, mutually beneficial projects. Another project is the uh, Iran-Pakistan pipeline project that uh, we wanted to pursue, which is uh, a lot of work had already been done, but the work is now suspended because of the suspension law. And we are hoping that um, uh, now that the uh, 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 P5 plus Iran uh, discussions on the nuclear issues is, uh, is progressing um, and sanctions would be lifted, uh, we will be able to pursue that project. Um, uh, so these, uh, 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 as far as uh, uh, Pakistan is concerned, that you know, a couple of other things that uh, we uh, would like to, I would like to mention that uh, Pakistan has transformed in many ways uh, in terms of developing these uh, regional uh, outreach. Uh, for, um, in, we have there is a realization in Pakistan of the uh, of the mistakes that were committed in the past, and there is a determination that we are not going to commit those mistakes in the future. Uh, it is in our interest that situation in Af Afghanistan does not go back to the 1990s. Uh, the takeover of Taliban. Uh, is number one out of the question. Plus, uh, that is something that uh, uh, we would uh, prevent uh, at any cost. 
uh, we feel that uh, 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 that we need to uh, move forward in our relationship with India. Uh, we need to resolve all those issues between our two countries, whether they uh, relate to Kashmir, whether Siachen Glacier issue, whether Sir Creek issue, or water issues, or terrorism issues related to terrorism, they should be resolved uh, through um, uh, negotiations. Uh, finally, uh, the way forward certainly is uh, sustained engagement between the regional countries, building trust, and allaying each other's concerns. Um, um, number two, um, we, what we are in our discussions with Afghanistan and other countries, we, we are telling them the security of the region is also indivisible. Uh, uh, any, for instance, any arrangement that any country works out with Afghanistan must also take into account Pakistan's own security concerns. And a regional consensus is some, uh, of non-interference in Afghanistan is something that we are actively pursuing. In the case of India, a sustained dialogue, there is no other option. Uh, diplomacy is perhaps the most um, uh, cost-effective way of moving forward in our relationship. Uh, resolution of all outstanding issues in accordance with uh, international legality is, and also in accordance with the past agreements is something which is of paramount importance. And then um, uh, promotion of shared prosperity should be the common objectives of all uh, uh, countries of the region. I would uh, conclude my remarks with a famous verse uh, by Rudyard Kipling's uh, Cities and Thrones and Powers. When, and I quote, cities and thrones and powers stand in time's eye, almost as long as flowers, which daily die, but as new birds put forth to glad new men out of the spent and unconsidered earth, the cities rise again. Thank you so much. And I'm ready to take questions uh, from the floor. Raise your hand. Please. Please, sir. Several years ago, I read in uh, like The Economist magazine that there was a consensus of all elements of Pakistani society that India was not just a problem but a mortal enemy, a threat to the very existence of Pakistan as a state. So I have two questions. First of all, was there ever a time that that was really true? And then second, you talked about transitions in Pakistan. If there was a time when that was true, what could India do to help parts of Pakistani society stop believing that? You know, um, the perceptions are built due to the ground realities. Uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, the role that India played in the um, separation of East Pakistan from Pakistan, active active support that was given to to um, the the elements, or the role that India is playing in Balochistan, for instance, that is certainly a matter of great concern for Pakistan, and that also builds a certain perception in Pakistan. And then uh, Siachen Glacier, Gla Siachen Glacier is another issue. Uh, which a glacier belongs to Pakistan, which was occupied by India in 1984. There was an agreement between the two prime ministers, late Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and uh, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, late Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi, that whereby, according to that agreement, the Indian forces which had occupied that glacier, they would get back to, they would uh, withdraw to the locations where, from where they had come from. And then you also, you're also witnessing uh, the water issues. The water is becoming a major issue in Pakistan because of the shortage of water. And um, 
and what is being perceived in Pakistan as a violation of the Indus Waters Treaty by India. When they are constructing some dams uh, which, are, which uh, violate the treaty provisions, and which result in the reduction of Pakistani share of water because the treaty that distributes the share of water between India and Pakistan. So these are some of the um, ground realities which build up this perception in Pakistan about the perception that you were talking about. But I think the, uh, the important thing is that we need to engage with each other. This on-off approach that has been followed for the last many years by the two countries. We need to get away from that approach. Uh, war is certainly not an option. People of India, they know it. Uh, people of Pakistan, they know it. Um, economic development cannot take place without improvement of relationship between the two countries. The people of the two countries, they are very well aware of this. As I mentioned that um, there was absolutely no anti-India rhetoric in our domestic politics. One only hopes that the uh, political parties in India also during their election campaign would get away from this uh, phenomena that had pre in, the, uh, that in the past had existed in both the countries. So these are the kind of things which, uh, and I think some bold and courageous decisions will have to be taken by the leadership. Uh, you can't simply, uh, 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 suspension of talks, uh, for what? I think the talks, there is absolutely no option but to continue to talk to each other to find ways to resolve issues. And that's how you will build the, uh, build the trust in Pakistan, uh, uh, amongst the Pakistani public. Here's a question. Yes, sir. In a recent, uh, article in the Congress, Prime Minister Modi's foreign policy has been described as look east policy. And his uh, planned visit to Japan, Myanmar, and Vietnam perhaps have been cited as a, as a reason to characterize it as look east policy. How is, uh, in your view, if it's an appropriate term to describe, which way is Pakistan foreign policy? <laughs> well, I, <laughs> you see, the, our, uh, our, our foreign policy is very, very straightforward. Um, our foreign policy, obviously, the uh, uh, peace in the region is of paramount importance because unless there is a regional peace, whether you look east or west, I think the, uh, you won't be able to, um, to achieve your, uh, uh, the, the, the long-term uh, prosperity that you want to ensure for your people. So accordingly, for our, for us, priority would be to improve, improve an improved Im environment between India and Pakistan, and a settlement of issues uh, in Afghanistan. I think once we are able to achieve that, we are, uh, we will be able to uh, make a lot of progress. In other words, if you talk about obviously the relationship with the United States of America, that they constitute uh, one of the most important uh, aspect of our foreign policy. Um, uh, uh, relations with China is again something which is of uh, paramount importance to us. Um, and uh, relationship with all the other, we have, uh, as I mentioned, that the kind of role that Pakistan has been playing in the past, we, um, uh, it is because of the a degree of uh, a positive role that Pakistan has been playing in the past. Uh, our relationship are not at the cost of our relationship with the other countries. For instance, in the past, we were, uh, uh, we were, uh, 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 we were the frontline state when Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. We stood with the United States of America in defeating the Soviet forces. In the case of uh, U.S.-China rapprochement, again, again uh, I'm sure that you must be aware that we played a, a formidable role in building a strong relationship. Similarly, uh, today when I am talking to you from this forum, I am not only representing uh, Pakistan as Pakistan's ambassador, but I also represent Iranian interests in, in this country. 
Um, so that is also, that falls in my area of responsibility. That also goes on to, uh, to, to demonstrate the kind of trust that exists, number one, between Iran and Pakistan, and also between the United States of America and Pakistan in kind of building a bridge between. So that's the kind of a policy that we would like to pursue in the future. Sure. Sure. I have two questions. You mentioned about uh, India calling off the talk uh, at the sec foreign secretary level. Uh, Indian media has been talking that uh, the Pakistani ambassador meeting, uh, the head of the <coughs> Was there a need for him to meet, or is there something more than that? Because uh, the Indian media gave the impression like Modi is sincerely interested in uh, developing better ties with Pakistan. So can you give some insight? That is one yes. question. The second, I would very much like to know, since you have been secretary or involved with this foreign relations for such a long time, how do you think India and Pakistan can resolve this Kashmir issue? Can you throw some light on how can they try to reconcile Kashmir, yeah. knowing the realities of the war? As far as um, uh, the High Commissioner meeting the Kashmiri leaders, or, uh, or any official from Pakistan visiting India and meeting the Kashmiri leaders, that's something that has been a norm since 1947. And India has never raised an objection never in the past an objection was raised. And the objection was not raised for some legitimate reasons. The legitimate reasons were that Kashmir is an internationally recognized dispute between Pakistan and India. Number one, there are three parties to this dispute. Uh, one is Pakistan, one is uh, India, and also the th third party is the people of Jammu and Kashmir. As a matter of fact, our interaction with Kashmiri leaders has helped reduce the, uh, the level of violence in Kashmir because whenever there used to be an eng engagement in the past between uh, either Pakistan and India or Pakistan and the uh, Kashmiri leaders, an impression would uh, go to the Kashmir that things are moving forward. So accordingly, we absolutely see no justification for calling off these talks simply because the High Commissioner uh, met with the Kashmiri leaders. That is, an, uh, uh, that is an aspect which is being criticized by the, not only by the Indian uh, academics, the analysts, the newspapers in their editorials, but also I'm sure that you must have seen the New York Times report, which was also uh, editorial, which was also very critical of this uh, move. And also this has eroded the perception to be very honest, that um, things were, would move forward uh, after uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, winning this election through a landslide victory. That's number one. Kashmir issue, um, uh, to be again honest, we have in the past discussed a number of options in the past. Uh, including uh, some of the options which were discussed recently when the former president was, uh, Musharraf was in power. Um, there were discussions taking place uh, between, um, uh, through the uh, back channel uh, negotiations which were taking place between the two governments. And, um, uh, and both the sides, they claimed that significant progress had been achieved. And what that uh, entailed, basically that uh, the formula that being that one you know we need to recognize the disputed character of kashmir india recognizes number two we need to find a solution which is acceptable to pakistan india and the people of kashmir <coughs> number three um, uh, we need to give uh, maximum autonomy to the for the time being till such time a fall for a final solution emerges, ex maximum autonomy to the respective Kashmir's. Uh, withdraw the forces, because forces also generate uh, a lot of uh, violence in, in, um, uh, on, uh, in Kashmir. So these are the kind of parameters uh, that was being worked out. Again, my, I will go back to my previous submission that there is absolutely no option 
but to follow an approach which is problem-solving approach. So far, both India and Pakistan, we have been following a wooden-headed approach. There has been a transformation in Pakistan, as I said, and by following a wooden-headed approach of the previous years, we certainly would not be able to get out of this vicious circle. Yes, sir. Mr. Ambassador, my question involves the current dispute between Imran Khan's party and the Pakistani government. Yes. I read a few hours ago that uh, the military has agreed to serve as a mediation device. I've also been reading that there are a lot of people that are making comments outside of Pakistan that this is another re-involvement of the Pakistani military in a democratically elected government. Can you update us and tell us what has happened and, and what you feel like this mediation process involves with the military? You know, the, uh, the current political crisis, um, number one, we have to be very clear that, uh, that democracy in Pakistan has taken very strong roots. I have absolutely no doubt that there is absolutely no threat to democracy in Pakistan, and I can say with full confidence. I have, you know, if a similar situation had arisen in the past, you would perhaps see a military takeover. The military takeover is also not, you know, going to take place. Um, the army is playing a, a very, very positive role in the current crisis. They uh, obviously, they're also, they would want a, the strengthening of the democracy. You know, we need to remember that when I mentioned that Pakistan has changed, it has really changed. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 you know, overwhelming support that democracy is, enjoys in Pakistan is something which is, uh, which is uh, extremely positive for us. We need to remember that in the parliament, uh, only three days ago, uh, every political party minus Imran Khan's party, which was present in the parliament, they passed a resolution that they will, no, they will not accept any step which is unconstitutional. So these are the kind of things that uh, give us a lot of hope that the coming days are going to, uh, to augur well for Pakistan. And anything that emerges out of this crisis is going to further strengthen this democracy. I have absolutely no doubt. And I have to substantiate in case there is, a, if, uh, there is an agreement that the election commission would be made totally independent and, um, uh, and impartial, uh, a proper mechanism would be established. I think that's something that would be very good for the country. Uh, but I don't see, uh, or people of Pakistan don't see any threat to democracy at all. Thank you. Uh, this will be the last question, whoever. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Pakistan has a functioning judiciary. What is the, uh, the future outlook for uh, President or ex-President Mush uh, Musharraf? Well, I think the um, again the case is uh, with the judiciary and the judici there are uh, um, and um, whatever the decision is taken by the judiciary, uh, whatever the outcome of the legal uh, process that is currently underway, that would be acceptable uh, to everybody in Pakistan. Uh, so there is absolutely no doubt about it. No question from the ladies uh, sitting in this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>